This is an incredible program, isn't it? This is an incredible conference, yes. It brings together some of the various disciplines that we need to look at. We are living indeed in momentous times. Momentous times because the non-infectious diseases are taking over. The chronic diseases are taking over. Take a look. Heart disease, stroke, diabetes, cancer. These are diseases that were not always part of our culture. To give you some idea, a textbook was published in 1928 by a very well-known, actually famous physician, Sir William Osler, and he wrote, in 1928, you can expect one heart attack per year in average hospital, in average sized town. Things have changed because today we experience 4,000 heart attacks a day in this country. This is a new epidemic. You look at breast cancer rates, and again, 1960, we would expect one out of 20 women to develop breast cancer. 20 years later, one in 11. Now it is one in seven women that can expect to experience breast cancer. And then you look at the costs involved here. And the important part of this particular overhead is that the medical costs have risen dramatically. And you say, well, it's probably all part of uh, inflation. So I've put another uh, relationship here for you, and that is the percent of money that we spend of our income on medical care. 1960, we spent about 4 to 5% of our income on medical care. Today, it is 19%. Something is happening. And what is very, very important here is that 84% of our medical dollar in this country, in North America, 84% of our medical dollars is spent on chronic disease. Chronic disease. And yet the best we can do, medically speaking, is to manage the symptoms of these, most of these diseases. Because these are diseases that are lifestyle related. They have to do with our behaviors. And yet many times we use mechanistic approaches, pharmacological approaches, and the best we can do oftentimes is to just make you feel better and the disease continues. Chronic disease, it means they hang around. And one of the most devastating ones is diabetes. Diabetes is the mother of all chronic diseases because it takes your body apart from top of your head all the way down to your toes. Every organ becomes affected by diabetes. And diabetes, for, for very special reasons, has been considered to be the mother of all chronic diseases because of its devastating consequences. And yet, it doesn't have to be that way. Fourth week in our randomized clinical trial, 100 people with heart disease have joined this clinical controlled trial. Our goal is to show that within one year, we can reverse coronary artery disease and strokes by helping people to go on a very simple diet, a diet of simple elegance, foods as grown plus exercise, plus a good attitude towards life. We're now fourth week, and one of my participants raised her hand and says, Dr. Deal, could I make a statement? I have no idea what she's gonna say. But we've already seen significant voices among the participants that have been raised that said, we are doing so much better we're feeling better, but that again doesn't mean very much to me. Anybody can feel better on any kind of a program. But what are the data? And then she said, for 12 years, I've been told that I needed to count my calories. I need to count my carbohydrates, that I had to eat lean meat to take care of my diabetes. 
For 12 years, it has been hammered into me, don't eat starch, don't eat sugar, don't eat carbohydrates, because they're turning into blood sugars. For 12 years, I've been going from medication to medication, and now I'm on 30 treaters of insulin. And then she said, and this morning, fourth week of the CHIP program, fourth week in this randomized controlled trial, this morning, I took my blood sugar, and it was all the way down to 90, and I knew that I had to reduce my insulin again. And now I'm down to seven units of insulin in just four weeks. And before, it would go higher and higher and higher, and more and more medication, and more and more overweight, and I didn't know what to do. And then she said in tears, I don't really believe that these numbers are right, because I cannot change my, my, my understanding. I mean, everything has changed. In just four weeks, my insulin is down to those few units now. Every day, I had to take about one, two, three units of insulin down. And I had been afraid, this cannot last. There must be something wrong. And I said, no. For the first time, you're doing something right. For the first time, we're turning the therapeutic approach around. Because... In all sincerity and with great respect to my colleagues, when it comes to taking care of type 2 diabetes, if you do everything opposite of what your physician di dietitian has told you, you'll be well in four to eight weeks in most cases. <laughs> and so I want to sound an alert, a diabetes alert. It is estimated that every second American adult will either have diabetes already or will develop the full-blown disease process. Every second American adult. Let's take a look at the trends. Here are some of the trends in the prevalence rates of diagnosed diabetics. We're looking here uh, at uh, the time period from 1994 to 2009. Take a look. 1994, you can see the, um, the prevalence uh, of diabetes in percent of the adults in America by state. And when you look at some of the colors, you realize that probably less than 5% in 1994 were diagnosed with diabetes. Three years later, it is now more like 5% of the population. Then, 2,000, three years later, it is now more like 6, 7% of the adult population. Three years later, it is now 7, 8% of the adult population. 2006, it is now 9%, and 2009, more than 9%. What has happened? In just 15 years, the rates of diabetes have doubled, and they double every 15 years. Now, you have seen this pattern before, haven't you? Do you remember we talked about obesity? Do you remember what happened there? <clears throat> this is really scintillating. This is an exciting lecture, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we have seen the same trends in obesity because every five years we have seen the uh, rate of obesity going up by 5% in the adult population of our society. So that by by 2010 now, more than 30% of the adults in America are suffering from obesity. And here you see a very interesting parallel. Every 15 years, obesity doubles. Every 15 years, obesity doubles. Do you see a possible parallel there? Diabetes. We have seen a 900% increase since 1945, and especially in the last 50 years, diabetes has increased by 700%. Now, sometimes people have the idea that diabetes is a genetic disease. It's in the DNA, there's nothing I can do about it. Let's be careful about this. It takes about 300 to 400 years to change the genetics in a society. This has happened in the last 50 years, 700% increase. This cannot be genetics. Somebody must have put something into the water. Or could it be that maybe we have changed our diet? Think about it. It's an enormous shift that is taking place. Now, if a person has a genetic predisposition, they are not doomed to be developing diabetes if they make some lifestyle changes. Because as we talked about obesity, 
There are some genetic predispositions, but you have to pull the trigger of the gun that represents the genetics in order to fire the shot. And the genetics can be overridden by the epigenetics, our lifestyle. We can suppress the bad genes, and we can strengthen and modulate upward the good genes. So here you see uh, the governmental assessment. Diabetes has been inexorably advancing, doubling every 15 years. The chance of becoming a diabetic in the US for a newborn baby in a lifetime is now one in three. If you're Hispanic by background, one in two. Babies will become diabetics in a lifetime. And then the National Institute of Health says, and we have no medical cure. But the cure is found in what you are willing to do for yourself. This is largely a self-made disease. This is a disease that is culturally promoted because it's a very profitable disease at the expense of the people. Now let's take a look at what we have. The latest stats show that we have 29 million diabetics. About 21 million have been identified already, diagnosed. 28% don't even know that they have diabetes. And then you have another pre-diabetics, 86 million. Now you think, well, pre-diabetic, so what does that mean? That means you are on your way. You have been developing some of the complications unknown or asymptomatically for you. 29 million diabetics, 86 million pre-diabetics, which means 115 million Americans. And since this is largely an adult disease, you put it in correlation with the amount of adults that we have in the society, and you begin to realize that every second adult in America has a diabetes or is at risk for diabetes. I just came back from the Caribbean islands, and there I was in Dominica. 25 years ago, the chief of... Uh, the medical officer of the island said to me, 25 years ago, when you came, it was difficult to find diabetes. I said, I remember. He said, today, every second person on our island either has diabetes or is developing diabetes. It is the globalization of our diet that leads to the globalization of diabetes. Now, how do you define diabetes? How do you know that you have diabetes? How do you define diabetes? Well, there are different scales. On the right-hand side, you see the fasting blood sugar, and usually when you have blood sugar below 100, we usually consider that to be fairly normal. When you have blood uh, sugar between 100 and 125, that's what we call pre-diabetes, and anything above 125 usually is considered to be full-blown diabetes, but the disease already begins earlier. So if I ask you, how do you define diabetes? It's a blood sugar that is excessively high above 125. Anything between 100 to 125 usually is pre-diabetes. Are, Are you with me there? Yeah. yeah, okay. Now, there's another scale. It's called the hemoglobin A1C. This is what we use in scientific studies. It's a blood sugar that you develop over a period of three months. It's fairly stable because the other blood sugars, they can sort of vary, go up and down somewhat. This is a fairly stable assessment for research. And here we look at numbers like anything below 5.7 is healthy, anything between 5.7 and 6.5 is pre-diabetic, and then anything above 6.5 we consider to be full-blown diabetes. Now this is becoming very, very important, these hemoglobin A1C. Why? Because just one point difference, so if you go from 10 to 9, or you go from eight to seven, and you become more normal again. One point difference translates into the change in risk for different complications. For instance, if you are increasing your A1C by one point, your nerve damage goes up by 37%, vision loss 37%, blindness, kidney disease, renal disease 37% higher, amputation or death due to peripheral vascular disease increases by 43%. So these are very powerful um, indicators that help us to understand the tremendous risk for the complications and what you can expect when you are moving towards diabetes. So if you don't have these tests available, how does a person know that they are possibly diabetic. Number one, they find uh, there's a 
what we call polydipsia. That means these people are thirsty all the time. And so they drink more, and with it, you have polyuria. That means you are now getting into an exercise program from the living room to the bathroom many times a day. That's right. So you have frequency in your nation that really goes up. Then you have polyphagia. That means you're hungry all the time. I mean, even if you have just eat, you're still hungry. Diabetes, possible. Then you have to worry about blurred eyesight, tingling in your hands and fingers, feeling fatigued and tired. You just don't have the get up and go anymore. And then, of course, for men, oftentimes the first sign of diabetes is erectile dysfunction or impotence.